Hi, I'm Carrie. I'm Jake. And this is Love You Like Crazy. This is a podcast where we talk and rant about young adult books. So, Carrie. Yes, Jacob. This book that we're talking about today is a special request. It is. Um, from a um, a woman with a French name that I am probably not going to pronounce it correctly at all. So I apologize for that. But it's uh, Julie um, Dutrieu or something like that. Let's see if I can butcher it better. Okay. At Julia Schmidt 3. There you go. She suggested that we talk about the third book in the series that we've done the first two books of. Mm -hmm. And that would be... That would be Isla and the Happily Ever After by Stephanie Perkins. So we're going to do that thing. Um, And then at the end of this episode, we're going to have some announcements about plans for the future of the podcast. We sure are. Which hopefully will allow us to release episodes on a more regular schedule yeah all right well let's let's get to talking about isla pitter patter let's get at her tell me a story okay so i'm visiting you in san diego currently this is true and so i flew out here uh last week on saturday i know it's it's (laughs) the time is is both meaningless and yeah i think it's still last tuesday yeah in uh in rhode island um and i hadn't finished reading the book yet i had read a chunk of it but not okay the ending. so i get on this flight which is a five-hour flight and it's full so there's you know people sitting next to me and so i start reading it and i very quickly get to the chapter where isla takes Hattie up to the treehouse mm-hmm. for the first time, and uh, and what do you do, Jacob? I start crying. <laughs> I knew you were gonna say that. And it and was gives a, her the key, and yeah, and they have a little like sisterly moment of like maybe I could actually be friends with my annoying sister and admit that uh, that we care about each other and stuff, and uh, give you know. Sh- give her this special gift of the tree house that even my older sister who I get along with has never been. Uh, yeah. So I totally cried. And then I was like, I'm going to have to sit next to these people for the next five hours. <laughs> and it was a total thing. It was a thing. How was it a thing? Did you get the side eye? Uh, no, I was ignored. Okay, which is what you're looking. I'm looking for on a plane trip. I'm down with that. So it was it was a pointed ignore though. It was like a definitely we saw that and now we're just going to all ignore it. I don't know. I always assume that people can tell when I'm like quietly sobbing to myself. <laughs> um, but that may or may not be accurate. I don't know. Like I couldn't tell that you were crying or trying to hold back the tears from our when you reach me episode. Oh, okay. I couldn't tell. But I'm also a heartless bitch and I don't notice anything. <laughs> uh, I think I might have to roll back the tape on that. Miranda's mother gets there and then she, you know, she uses her law knowledge and ability to get people to do what she wants them to, to get them to go away and back to the office and sort of call the parents and stuff and everything manages to get straightened out um sniffle yeah <laughs> so so that's my little story about reading isla um how do you want to start talking about this book i would like to ask you how many stephanie perkins books we've read four of the four there are three that are sort of part not necessarily part of a series but certainly are semi-related intertwined a little bit there are her love stories Mm -hmm. how would you rank them i mean strictly speaking um there's someone in my house is the story of a man's love for murder (laughs) (laughs) anyway so i i would say so i would rank them uh i thought i like i think i liked anna the best and then lola and then isla did you dislike any of them? No. Because they're Stephanie Perkins books, and it's really hard to dislike them, even when it is a story of a man's love for murder. <laughs> I could still find things I like, even though I didn't love that book. There are parts of it I really liked. So. Yeah. And so, and 
your rankings, I take it, are similar. It goes 2-1-3 for me. So it's Lola first, probably, and a second, probably, and Isla third. Mm -hmm. It depends on the day, like, because Lola is my happy place. I can pick up any part of that book and... I know where I am. I know who I'm with. I know what's going on. I've read that book so many times that sometimes I tell um, my gentleman caller, you know, I'm reading Lola tonight. And he's like, got it. I know where you are. I know where your headspace is and I am going to ignore you. <laughs> Smart man. And the fact that my gentleman caller is six and a half feet tall is not at all related to my love for Cricket Bell, but maybe a little bit. So I think, I don't know, see what you think about this theory, which is based on I'm ready very for little. It. Um, so I feel like, uh, you know, so as you say, it's a series of, you know, YA romances. And so there are like certain kind of structural things that are kind of expected. Like the, I would say that the, that atypical romance plot is like, you know, boy meets girl, boy and girl start going out. Then they break up and then they get back together again. Like that's sort of the structure. Mm -hmm. And and it's also like a romantic comedy thing where you've got two people who are clearly perfect for each other, but something keeps them apart mm -hmm. until a certain point when they realize that they're perfect for each other and then they get together. And Anna is like follows that pattern. Like the thing that, that mm -hmm. keeps her and St. Clair apart is that they're both dating other people. I mean, St. Clair is more dating somebody than Anna is. True. Anna is is interested in somebody who is dating her best friend back in another country. Yeah. Uh, where St. Clair's girlfriend is right there in Paris. Yeah. Of course there's Dave, but we, we don't talk about Dave. Dave is a chode <laughs> and he can die in a fire, that, but that... he's going to say he had sex with me first. Oh uh -huh. yeah. Dave, Dave, <laughs> what even the hell? So, um, you know, and so then they get together and then in, in, um, so then, like, that formula is sort of played with in Lola, where they've already dated. Like, this is after they've dated or something, right? Sort of. They didn't really date, but they were they were very clearly interested in, in each other. And, like, the young love dated, but didn't actually, like, I don't think they ever made anything official. Yeah. So, like, kind of the obstacle is that they're, I, I mean, um, Lola is mad at him and well for for good and not good reasons you've read that book like a lot more times than i have his sister kept them apart yeah and then they moved i mean so not only did her heart get broken but then she never got a chance to sort of like get over it with him or through him he just disappeared because they moved again and then came back and he's like i want to spend every minute i can with you and she's like i got a boyfriend dude yeah and so then in this book, like they get together super early. So that was like the kind of the difference in this one is they get together really early. And then about halfway through the book, I was, I think it's almost exactly halfway through the book, they break up. Mm -hmm. And then the rest of the book is sort of the consequences, you know, sort of the follow up to that. And that was like my favorite part of the book really is after they broke up. <laughs> <laughs> like that was the part that I found the most interesting. Fuck love. Well, I mean, partly it's just because like when they get together that early, I'm like, well, obviously something's going to happen. Yeah. And so I found myself just kind of wondering being a little, how it was going to happen right. and what was going to happen. Yeah. Just being a little impatient yeah. about it. I don't know. Was your experience similar or? I think it was. I think, you know, Stephanie Perkins makes it pretty explicit in her titling of, you know, what's going to happen in the book. We know that Anna is going to have a French kiss. We know that Lola is going to have something with the boy next door. And so we know that I Isla is going to have a happily ever after. But we don't we don't actually know with whom she's going to have the happily ever after. And I honestly thought at some point it was going to be her best friend. Somehow, you know, because mm. she'd made such a big deal about how we grew up together and we've known each other for so long and we sleep in the same bed. But there's nothing, nothing, nothing. I was like, but what if? Right. But no. No. Um, he likes tall girls. He likes tall girls. And she's wicked short. Nothing wrong with that. No, nothing wrong with it. <laughs> I am wicked short. So I thought the book might end in a couple different places. Um, 
I felt like there were a bunch of places where it could have ended. And in general, I wasn't mad that it didn't end there. Like I was like, oh, is it ending? Oh, it's not. Oh, that's all right. You know. Mm -hmm. Um, So like I actually thought it might end after the scene in the treehouse with the with her younger sister. Just because I thought that would be like a nice thing where like it's like, oh, wait, I can have other friends because she's sort of ruminated on the fact that like she doesn't really have any friends other than Kurt. And then once she got kind of distracted with Jots, Kurt managed to find other friends and she still doesn't have any other friends. So she's like, oh, wait, maybe maybe I'm the reason that we don't have any friends. Um, So you thought maybe the happily ever after would be self-love. Yes, uh, I, I, to to quote uh, the masterpiece of modern uh, books, the selection. Uh, I, choose I choose myself. Me. Yeah, I choose me. <laughs> I've been trying to put myself back together, and Maxon really cares about me. You mean so much to me, you know you do. But I'm part of this now, and I'd be stupid to not let myself see what happens. So you're choosing him over me, he asked miserably. No, I'm not choosing him or you. (laughs) I'm choosing me. Oh, but you're so not. (laughs) Well, yeah, like just that, you know, she's had this experience. She's learned things from it. She's got plans to sort of improve herself. And she sort of goes on to a more hopeful future. Mm which may or may not include Josh as a romantic partner, you know, but we would have hopes. And then, I mean, I guess that's not really a happily ever after. That's more of like a, some weird postmodern deconstruction of a romance novel, but that's like, I'm 40. That's what you're hoping for. I'm a 47 year old single man. I like it. What do (laughs) do you expect me to want? Um, And then uh, the other thing was what I thought would have made a really good ending. Maybe would be when, um, that it ended when St. Clair and Anna got engaged. Like I thought that was kind of because it would have that hopefulness, but then it would also have a romantic resolution. And then maybe the happily ever after is Anna and St. Clair's, but also by implication, you know, like, yeah, this is also a postmodern deconstruction of a romance. It didn't end too much after Anna and, and, and Etienne got engaged. True. Just really one major scene later. Um, or two major scenes. Later. I think it's there's like two or three chapters left. Really? Because I thought it was just she reads the book. Yes. She sees him again, and she because he's still under the fucking street light, like shivering his ass off. Mm-hmm. Oh, and then she has him come and, and live in her dorm for a while, I guess. Yes, but then there's a final chapter which I forgot about until I reread it today. <laughs> okay. Which was that. You know, it's sort of a flash forward, and they're at uh, Kismet again, I think. Yeah. She goes in. He's, like, sitting there drawing, like, and she goes over, and what he's drawing is them sitting at Kismet. And then, you know, and, and he's kind of like, well, this is the final panel of our story so far, and or something. She does, That's not what he says. He yeah. says something less stupid. But <laughs> that's sort of how I interpreted it. And then she's like, oh, well, what happens after this panel? And he says, happily ever after. And it's, uh, you know. The end. The end. It's uh, it's sort of like when we end our episodes by say, telling each other that we love each other like crazy. But we do. We do. So what did, um, do we want to go straight to the ending? I mean, we kind of have, but I feel like there are things to be said about it. Maybe there's other things we should want to talk about first, but I don't know what. There are lots of things to talk about in this. Okay, so there's a character named Isla. How's that spelled? I-S-L-A. How do stupid people pronounce it? Isla. How did I pronounce it when we did uh, Anna and the French Kiss? Isla. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) With all that, I understood. I'm not saying you're stupid, but (laughs) I'm saying she would call you stupid. Yeah. Um, So Isla is um, also at the same... um, French school that Anna and Etienne met at, or at which Anna and Etienne met. Um, but the the book opens with her in New York City, which is where she lives. Her mother is French. Her dad is American. 
And uh, she goes into a coffee shop after getting her wisdom teeth out and sees a handsome gentleman. A just handsome gentleman that she recognizes from school. Who she's had a wicked crush on since like minute one. Yes. And um, and she normally, so she is very shy in mm-hmm. general. But in this case, she's hopped up on goofballs. And uh, so she's super goofy and like just sort of marches up to him and introduces herself and like is um i would say like kind of kooky in a sort of movie kind of way of where there's a kooky female character she's like she's super silly she's flirty she's hungry <laughs> And then she falls asleep and drools all over her arm. And then, uh, so that's chapter one. And then chapter two is just one sentence. Oh my God, what did I do last night? (laughs) (laughs) How many of us had said that exact same thing in their own chapter two? Yes, that's a good chapter two. I have many a time had a, a next day going, oh my God, what did I do? What did I do? What did I do? What did I say? Oh, fuck. Mm. Um. And so then, so they both go to uh, the School of America in Paris, a.k.a. Soap. Yes, they go to Soap. And they both live in Manhattan. Josh is kind of split between Manhattan and D.C. because his father is a senator. Correct. Joshua Wasserstein is the only child Yes. of, of Senator and Mrs. Wasserstein. And Isla is the middle child of three. Um, and at some point it is revealed that her parents, uh, named their children after the places where they were conceived. Correct. So, um, Isla was conceived on Prince Edward Island in Canada. Correct. Hattie was. Manhattan. Yep. And then, uh, let's see the other sister. Jen. Jean Vieve, who's like the patron saint of Paris or something. Ah, Yes. I mean, there are women named Paris, but maybe they didn't want to. Yeah, I I think, you know, depending on exactly when the children were all conceived, I mean, would that be around Paris Hilton era? Um, I don't know. I'm not really sure when this takes place because the continuity is interesting, right? Because the books were written years apart, but they all kind of take place. So like... Certain cell cell phone technology might not have existed in in Anna that suddenly exists in Isla. Because Anna didn't have a smartphone, but they probably had them in Isla. Yeah, I mean, the phones are kind of like a character in Isla. Because there's like, you know, Josh's phone gets gets confiscated by his parents. And then he like can sometimes borrow other people's phones. And who the fuck knows anybody's phone number to borrow somebody's phone? I don't know anybody's phone number. Yeah, I I uh, I know what you mean. If my phone got confiscated tomorrow, I I couldn't call anybody. I know my dad's phone number, but that's because we had it when I was five years old. Exactly. Like I could call my childhood home, but I don't know who lives there, or mm-hmm. if that's the you know. It's like I don't know anything. I don't know people's phone numbers. Anyway. Yeah. I thought that was sort of weird that he can just like pick up anybody's phone and be like. Hey, baby, because I I don't know anybody's number. Hey, girl. Hey, girl. Hey. Um, let's see. What was the point of all that? Uh, so. So they fall in love. They fall in love. Um, and she has already been in love with him. And he. For so long. And he. He oh, has been interested in her. Because she reads comic books and is cool. But she doesn't think she's cool. <laughs> This is a trope you love, obviously. Obviously. (laughs) As a girl who loves comic books, I want hot gentlemen to be like, oh, I've always wanted you because you are cool. So, yeah. So he's interested in her. And then he, like, realizes that she's interested in him when she is hopped up on goofballs. But then he goes back. This is something we only learn much later. But he went back to the same coffee shop name. As did she. Right. But she brought her best friend. Kurt mm-hmm. and Josh thought that they were not just BFFs. Yes. Everybody thinks that Kurt and Isla are not BFFs. Uh, it's pretty much everyone at the school thinks that they're together. Yeah. 
because she asked him, you know, wait, you think that we're together? Just, oh, my God, does everyone think that we're together? And he was like, "Uh, yeah. I think he said probably. Okay, so, well. But anyway, yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, so he, so then he like is like, well, I have to stay away. And then at a certain point, uh, when they're back at, at school, he decides he, you know, he, um, let's see, he's, oh, it's, uh, it's a Jewish holiday. I forget which one. I think it was Yom Kippur because he was, Yom Kippur is the day of atonement, I believe, right? Yes. Um, so that was like the day where, you know, to think about, you know, who you've wronged and so on. And so one of the things, so he was sort of thinking about what he'd been doing and so on. And he came to the conclusion that even if I love and he couldn't be boyfriend, mm -hmm. girlfriend, that he still wanted to be her friend. Mm -hmm. So then he goes and sees her. But then it's still weird because Kurt is around. and Kurt is always around. Um, we find out later, you know, that. Isla sort of feels a bit of responsibility for Kurt. Yes. Um, you know, Kurt stays in her room. Kurt and, and she go to the treehouse. I think she feels like she owes Kurt her all of her time. But also, she doesn't have anybody else anyway. I think that she uses Kurt as a bit of a crutch and an excuse for not making other friends. Well, she had a friend at one point. Yeah. Yeah. And that friendship ended because the friend was like, no, it's either Kurt or me. And she's like, well, deuces. But she never tries to make more friends. No. And, and that might have been what burned her. She might have been like, well, this is how people act around Kurt. So I'm, I'm done. So this is something that I was sort of thinking about in this book, which isn't explicitly a theme, I think, but it's sort of a little bit implicit. And maybe I'm, you know. I feel like we are, are delving you... into my psyche here. Oh, let's do that. Um, is that uh, if you're shy, um, people may think that you're unfriendly. And you're, you, what you will think about that is, I'm not unfriendly. I'm just shy. But sometimes maybe you are kind of unfriendly, really. <laughs> um, and so I feel like part of my... Something that I've kind of struggled with is to not use my shyness as an excuse to be a jerk to people if there's a situation where I don't really want to talk to them, um, which is something like this for a long time, like for a long time, I was just like, if someone would come up and ask me a question or like I'm reading and someone asked me a question about a book and I'd be like, I mean, I'm reading a book. Why are you talking to me? Cause it's fucking rude to come up to someone who's reading a book and talk to them. Yeah. I think that that is accurate, but also like when I started being a musician and playing out, um, at some, some you know, somewhat popular things like the empire review and Providence, mm -hmm. Then people would see me around and want to come up and like compliment me on my music or something. And I realized that I came to realize it took me longer than it should have probably that like if I'd looked at them like like gave them the sort of like why are what are you doing? Why are you talking to me? Like that was not really cool. That wasn't a good way to handle <laughs> that situation. <laughs> and do you think of yourself as shy? Yes. Really? Yeah, totally. Really? Uh-huh. Even though, like, you're always doing things and you know everybody, you think of yourself as shy. Yes. I don't think you're shy. Uh. But I'm looking at things from the outside, so maybe you're faking it really well. Well, I mean, I, you know, what I was just talking about involves a certain amount of faking it. But, yeah. Um, but I knew you before all of that. Yes. And you would, you know, you... You went to Stitch and Bitch. I did. And then you fucking took Stitch and Bitch over and you well, you've been doing it. You've been doing the thing. I mean, I feel like I'm usually the most quiet person at Stitch and Bitch. And if I'm at a party, I'm probably off to the side knitting and not really talking to anyone too much. And, you know. But you're still putting yourself out there by going. Yeah. Isla doesn't do that. Isla no. doesn't put herself out there to go. That's true. So Isla is not even attending the party, never mind sitting there reading a cool French comic book at the party. Yeah. 
I mean, not to make this episode all about me, but, but please, let's just do to that. give a little more context to all of this, like the reason that I started doing stuff like that is because when I moved back to Providence, I got a, I got my current job where I work from home. And then you can't just be a hermit. Right. Like I was going, I was literally losing my mind. Yeah. I think I, <laughs> I was like so lonely and it was terrible and yeah. it actually like took some friends being like hey let's plan some things so that you get out of the house <laughs> regularly <laughs> which friends were those uh, uh no one you know okay um, i was gonna say was it craig redacted or no no because no, that i mean, oh that was the other thing is i no longer had a roommate it was the first yeah. time in my life i had no roommate and then i was working from home oh so, yeah so, <laughs> so you're like, just, were you living you weren't living where you're living now though are you no i was living um you're living at the hooker house yeah i was living at the hooker house <laughs> you can edit all this out <laughs> uh, yeah I'll, well i don't know I, I may i may streamline it a bit <laughs> so it was like a matter of survival really mm -hmm. like if i if i didn't get out and about and it also required a lot a lot of intervention from my friends. Yeah. And uh, I really kind of owe them my Yo, life. Yo, I'm sorry, son. Damn, what a tragic way to end. The important thing now is that we're naked and we're friends. The moral of Isla. Isla and the Happily Ever After is make some friends, motherfuckers. Make some friends. So, uh, anyway, that was a long thing. Um, so, so they get together. But then Josh gets expelled. Josh gets expelled because they decide that they're going to go to Spain. And um, whoops, her sister needed to borrow her hairdryer. <laughs> yes. She goes to borrow the hairdryer. Kurt lets her in or something. She's not there. Oh, my God. Where is she? I mean, her door is broken. So, like, nobody needs to let her in. She just. I oh, think yeah. She, she just, just goes, goes in. in and she's not there. And instead of saying, huh. She's probably off somewhere with her boyfriend. She flips her shit. It's not and then, totally clear to me how it gets from point A to point B. But but then finally, somebody asks Kurt where she is. And Kurt won't lie or can't lie. And so he tells them. And Oh, they're in some deep shit. Yeah. This is Isla's first offense ever because of her shyness. And because she's never done anything you know, that wasn't part of the rules. She gets a warning. But Joshua, Joshua Wasserstein, um, it is not his first offense. He's done many things and he's out. Yeah. That's when the book starts to get good. <laughs> <laughs> now that they're broken up. Yeah. Jake is happy. Yes. <laughs> it's like, oh, there's some heartbreak. Yes. And oh, is their heartbreak. Yeah. They can't oh. see each other. They can't talk. Um, Mrs. Wasserstein fucking hates Isla. And it's not Isla's fault, but also, I mean, kind of, of course, it's kind of Isla's fault. It's not. I mean, well, I, I mean, it was Josh's. Josh idea. was going to go no matter what. But maybe it's Isla's fault they got caught. Yeah. Or Hattie's fault they got caught. Or Kurt's. You know, lots of playing to go, play, lots, lots of playing to go around. But really, it's it's you know, it's it's on him because he was the one who did all the things that got him expelled. So, so then they're supposed to get together the, at Thanksgiving, but then uh, Josh's dad gets invited to the White House for Thanksgiving, and you don't say no to the White House unless it's the current administration. Yes, I would happily say no to the White House right now. That's true. Like if we're set, if it were really set in the current day, then Josh could be like, fuck no, I won't go. I would rather have sex with my girlfriend. Thank you very much. Thank you for the offer. Die in a fire, motherfuckers. I feel like this book has more sex in it than the other ones. Oh, it's got a lot more sex than the other ones. I think um, Lola has offhanded comments about sex. Because we know that she'd had sex with, with her boyfriend. Very bad sex. Very bad sex. And then, like, at one point, you know, they had plans. And, and the next scene is, like, her getting dressed in his house. But there wasn't nearly as sexy as Isla is. Holy crap. There's some real boning in this one. There's some real boning. There's also, like, I want to draw all over your body kind of boning. Which is, that's some shit. Can't can't wash that off easily. <laughs> I let her tell her sister. Maybe you want to wash that blanket. 
it's good. And so, so the Thanksgiving thing doesn't work out. But then Josh's parents invite Isla to go to the the Met uh, for Christmas. And she does, and she gets very uncomfortable about things. Because it is an uncomfortable... It's kind of building. I mean, she doesn't know any of these people. She doesn't... She, she knows school Josh. She's never seen, like, Senator Wasserstein's son, Josh, before. So this was very new to her. Yeah, and I mean, I think it's He didn't legit- prep her well. He didn't prep her well. Uh, maybe he couldn't have since he doesn't have a phone anymore. Well, he could have talked to her in the car at pickup. Like, yeah. hey, here's the deal. Like, I know these people. I've known them my whole life. It's going to seem kind of weird to you. Um, I'm always me, but I'm a different version of me when I'm on for my dad. And then she would have been like, okay, this is this sucks, but okay, at least I'm, I'm a, li- a little prepared. Instead, he's just like... Yeah, we're going to do this thing, and it's going to be great. And then he gets there, and he's like, schmoozy McSchmooze. Yeah. And then he steals her away. He sure does. And they go to um, an Egyptian thing with Wait. a nice reflecting pool. And she she flips her shit. Well, she doesn't flip her shit until a little later. Shit will be flipped soon, yes. though. Because... Um, his ex-girlfriend who graduated the previous year. Yeah, Rashmi. So he has been drawing this comic book all about his time in this this boarding school called Boarding School Boy. Mm-hmm. And because Isla reads comic books and also loves him, she sort of convinced him, like, I'm ready to read this thing. So she's been reading it. And there's a whole lot of Rashmi in this. Yeah, I mean, both a lot. in quantity and... Uh, and nudity. Yeah, <laughs> correct. <laughs> and quality, friends. So, like, Isla has now seen all of his previous relationship with, with, with somebody else. And so she's feeling really insecure. She's like, I can't live up to that. He has you know, built her up into a literal goddess. And I think there's kind of this whole thing of like, you know, when you start going out with someone or or anything like that, you are like theoretically aware that they had a life before you and there are like other people they know and stuff. Never. Not before me. (laughs) And so, and she knows that and she understands it, which is why. Because she, she saw it. She saw them together at school. She knew that they, you know, she knew who Rashmi was because Rashmi's sister was her friend. But then, like, she is kind of expected to just sort of immerse herself in um, in his world in a way that he isn't expected to immerse himself in hers. Like, she reads his graphic novel, which is like, you know, just goes into her enti- his entire college degree in, like, excruciating detail, including naked pictures of a girlfriend and pictures of himself whacking off to other women and stuff. Oh, yeah. And then she goes to these parties... This party where, like, she doesn't know anyone. She doesn't know exactly how she's supposed to act. I mean, I'm sure that she's actually fine. And it's, you know, I mean, I don't think she's... I'm I'm sure she's she's fine enough, but... But it's uncomfortable for her. But it's uncomfortable. And and I I can understand that he doesn't really think of it in this way. Because as far as he's concerned, he's really uncomfortable, too. And he doesn't like it. But it's different. You know, he's used to it. Yeah. Even if he doesn't like it. Exactly. And then, um, you know, he takes it to the, the Egyptian temple... And, you know, and they make out and then like she's like thinking, well, his ex-girlfriend is an Egyptologist. And is that related to this somehow? You know, like and so she just is having these thoughts of like, how do I fit into this? And to me, that all like I don't necessarily know that she expresses it particularly well. But No, no, no. But she she expresses it. She expresses it. And I think it's legit. Like, this is, to me, this is a problem that I have with the book, is that at the end of the book, like, kind of her, the moral that she takes away from it is, like, you know, I was a bitch, basically. Like, this is, I did the bad thing. Josh is blameless. No, Josh is not blameless. And I didn't buy it. No. I mean, because she still is changing her life for him. She's changing her plans and her life for him. Right. 
And that's partly why I wanted one of my postmodernist deconstruction of the romance novel ending is because I kind of wanted to be like, I've had this experience and it was painful in many ways, but it was also valuable in many ways. And mm -hmm. it's changed the course of my life. I'm going to go to Dartmouth now, not because Josh is going to be nearby, but because it seems like a really great place where I'll actually learn things and have a good time. And she did choose it apart from Josh. Like she sent in... Or she had her dad send in the deposit before they got back together. So yes, it, it is it is separate from him. But it's also she would never have looked at the school had it not been for him. So I think that that's kind of like, you know, you sort of evaluate and you take the good and the bad. And there you have the facts of life. No, I refuse. <laughs> so, um, so then that's why when they, when they get together for real and she is like... You know, Josh was right all along and he's, you know, and I'm a blank slate and that's a f good thing to but be. But she's actually completely not a blank slate because everything that she did, she made things better. It's like she took his his giant masterpiece and she she fixed it. I mean, she wasn't kind about it, but who gives a fuck? Sometimes you got to be a little mean. Yeah. And he wasn't going to take anything, you know, he wasn't going to take any criticism well at that point anyway. So my was go for the jugular. Um, but she she pushed him to be better. She ended up sort of by by not a, by by pulling away, she pushed Kurt to be better. I mean, so she makes everyone around her better. So she can't be that bad. So she's not really the bitch. No, I don't think she is at all. Well, I no, think I she's think she, right. <laughs> I think she's right. I think I think she. I mean, she's not all right, but she, she's pretty I, right. I think I think it's it's a hard conversation to have when you've never had a conversation like that yeah. before. I mean, she's never broken up with anyone before. Not really. She had her, you know, her boyfriend Sebastian, um, but I, 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 it wasn't the same. And I think you know. When you have a, a big, important love, like, you're going to get it wrong sometimes. It's going to be messy sometimes. And so she got it wrong. And, well, she, no, she got it messy. Yeah. And that's okay. I really like that Kurt finds friends who also want to go into the sewers. I agree. It's, uh... I don't want to go into the sewers, but I'm glad Kurt found people. Yeah, I agree. It's a nice... Um... It's, yeah, so Kurt is uh, high-functioning autistic, I believe mm -hmm. is the description. Yep. And so, I mean, both of us have people with some degree of autism in our lives. And I don't know, what did you think? I mean, I'm kind of copping out here, but what did you think about Kurt's portrayal? Um, I think for the most part, it was okay. There were some things that I was just like, okay, that's just a little... Like, just because he has autism doesn't mean he's a robot. Right. And sometimes he's written a little robotically. I thought that too. I mean, autism doesn't mean you don't necessarily understand all social cues. My kid has autism. He understands social cues. He just doesn't care. <laughs> uh, yeah, I agree. I thought, particularly early on, I feel like he's... Becomes... Yeah. Yeah, I think once he finds his friends and isn't so, maybe so sheltered by Isla... Mm -hmm. You know, when he's forced because, you know, it, it shows him getting bullied a little bit and, you know, he, he's got to always hide out at her house and they've got to hide out at the tree house. And once she's out of the picture, he's fine. He finds people to go explore sewers with. He's fine. He finds people. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, I think at first he's he's a little like, OK, I guess we're we're. We have to like really like lay the autism on thick or it's not believable. But I don't know. The small autistic person in my life isn't anything like that, but it's a spectrum. So, I mean, I also have to sort of take that with a grain of salt, too, and just be like, well, you know, this could be somebody's accurate portrayal of someone they know and love. And they, they wrote their best friend. And it just so happens that I don't know. Yeah. But I thought it was a little much. 
yeah, I didn't really um, recognize my niece in that portrayal. But mm-hmm. as you say, different people. Would. So who knows? But yeah, it did. I, 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 it's one of those situations where if I knew that the author had consulted an autistic person about the portrayal, then I would probably feel better about it and be like, okay, well, maybe yeah. this is just someone's experience. But not knowing that makes me wonder a little yeah. bit. Yeah. Totally. Um, let's see. What the hell does this mean? I don't know. What does it say? U.S. News and World Report. Robots. Oh, I know what that's about. <laughs> I'm really curious. <laughs> so this is something, like, as I say, this is all about me and my own psyche. Uh, I love and, it. And probably this is has a very, therapy session. Very little to do with the book. Um, but uh, there, so... Uh, uh, Isla initially applies to two colleges, mm-hmm. the Sorbonne in uh, Paris. I think that's how it's pronounced. Sorbonne. Uh, bon. Yeah, that makes sense. That's how it's spelled. Hmm. I took French in high school. <laughs> I did not. So I'm just winging it. Yeah, I think you're right, though. Um, so uh, La Sorbonne, Columbia, and then later she applies to Dartsmith. 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 <laughs> Um, yeah, the little known. <laughs> it's sort of like how um, there's a movie studio that whenever a big movie comes out. A code. This is a message your grandfather left you. He left us. Only he can break. Professor Harry. Demons, omens, codes, monks. Da Vinci. Professor Langdon, you're in grave danger. They released their own movie yes. made for $10,000 that has a slightly different <laughs> title. The Da Vinci Treasure. I told you I'd be here for the payoff. So it's Dart Smith, and uh, it's a mail order college. I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> so she she applies initially just to two colleges, and the assumption is that she'll get into at least one. And Josh is certain that she'll get into both. Now Josh turns out to be wrong about that. I should make that clear. Is there anything Josh is right about besides the fact that Isla's pretty awesome? I don't know. Yeah, I think he's uh, best when he's artiest. So, like, <laughs> he, you know, when he paints his mural up in the treehouse, like, that's pretty cool. And Yeah. Um, but when he's using his uh, verbal brain, maybe not so much. <laughs> so, um, he's sure that he's going to get in all three. She actually only gets into two of the three. And uh, this bothered me because it's very similar to something I did, <laughs> which is that uh, when I was a senior in, in high school i applied to one college which was brown university and then i later applied to umass because i was like well eggs basket etc yeah but that was like the stupidest thing i did and the fact that it paid off because i got in was um i did not deserve that (laughs) Uh, (laughs) so and so it you know, like, don't, as you say, don't put those eggs in one basket. So you're like, well, I'm sure I'll get into one of the, you know, particularly, I don't know what things are like in France. It's probably different. But the admittance rate for these universities, the percentages are very low. And even though she might have connections or might have legacy or might have, I work in college admissions, y'all. Yeah, <laughs> I know what the numbers game looks like. And it ain't, it ain't in her favor. Even these students who, you know, apply to many Ivy League schools, you're still maybe going to get into one, maybe. Yeah. Uh, And it's going to be like a crappy one. (laughs) (laughs) It would be nice if you could see the look I just gave Carrie. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, but that's why I have U.S. News and World Report written down, because it's kind of their fault, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, because they they were the first ones to like do these big college ratings, mm-hmm. and one of the big rating things was um, how um, what's the word selective they were. Yes, and the result is that the big colleges encourage as many people as possible to apply to them, so that they can reject the vast majority yes. of them and increase their ratings. Absolutely, and that's why it's insane to like apply to two top level colleges and assume that you're going to get into one or both of them. I mean, you probably had a better chance than most to get into Brown. My sister went there. So first your legacy. legacy. I sent them a scarf as part of my uh, application. Okay. Never do that. (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> what the fuck were you thinking? It worked. It paid off, but oh my God. Yeah, no, everything, nobody should take my example as a good one. Do not do what I did. I'm um, so grateful that everything is done electronically now so i don't get any <laughs> random things in the mail from prospective applicants um so yeah so because of the way that's optimized uh right that's not the right way to do it no i want to look at your notes oh good <laughs> so i can i can take something off your plate here friend i think there's like five or six pages <laughs> oh, shit <laughs> intertextuality Ooh. oh yeah we should talk about intertextuality okay so there, because this is the third book in the series, um, their char- the characters from the first two books have cameos in this one. They do. I mean, so they also go backwards, too, because yes. obviously Josh is in Anna and the French Kiss, and Isla is very briefly in Anna and the French Kiss as well. Mm-hmm. Josh is very briefly in Lola. Not named. But- Not named, uh, but described. And um, Anna and St. Clair or Anna and Etienne are obviously in Lola. So they're all sort of connected. And then we get to this one and we meet all of them together. Right. And Anna and St. Clair get engaged in the end. As, as they sure do at point zero. Did that make you happy? Of course it made me yeah, happy. It was very happy making. <laughs> I mean, in in book two, Etienne says to to Lola, like, no, nah, I'm thinking long term. She's like, how long? And he's like, always, like all the way long. And she's like, holy fuck. I know grown ups. <laughs> <laughs> and in Lola, um, St. Clair gets a job at the movie theater. To, to save up for the future with Anna Banana. And that pays off here. And that pays off here because we see what he done with his money. Mm -hmm. Then they get engaged and all the friends are watching and then they, they run off and fuck. I'm assuming that's what's going to happen. Yeah. I mean, they're going to the Olympic village. (laughs) Oh, so much fucking is going to happen at the Olympic village. Oh, that's why cricket. That's actually why they all are there. Yes. They're all there because cricket bells, sister Calliope is a figure skater and is in the Olympics. And, um, Cricket's there for that, and Anna and Etienne are there sort of for that, and also just to go back to Paris, because that's where they met, and that's where their story began. Mm -hmm. And then um, Josh came with, because he could, and he'd put it on his calendar um, at home, Isla, and put a big heart around it, and his his mom just kind of gave him the begrudging, like, yep, nod, so... She came to terms with the fact that Josh and Isla were going to get back together, According, you know, at least Josh hopes so and um, wasn't a total snatch basket about it. Yeah, that's very cute. Mm -hmm. Let's see. What else did I write down on intertextuality? I think that's basically it. So this is a book about love and happily ever afters Mm -hmm. and uh, being a small cabbage. (laughs) Yes. Petit chou. Petit chou. So, yeah, I was glad to see Lola. I was really glad to see Cricket. I was happy that Anna and Etienne are doing the thing. And um, maybe Josh and Isla will have their happily ever after. Maybe maybe they won't, but they, they did actually make it to New England together. So we'll see. I just found one thing I wrote down um, intertextuality-wise, which is at one point Isla... Uh, gets the part of Josh's book that covers the events of Anna and the French Kiss. Mm. And so she like sort of summarizes what happens in this period. And then she summarizes it as it's a freaking soap opera. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, I did. I thought that was kind of It's true, though. Yeah, no, totally. It's a good soap opera. Yeah, it's my one of my favorite soap operas. Oh, and Calliope wins at the end. And Calliope wins the end because she has the curse of the second place. And she overcomes said curse. Ta-da. Ta-da. Now, there's one thing I want to... Oh, yeah. I think one of the reasons that that Lola went is because Lola probably designed her outfit. It might not have been stated, but she probably probably designed it and then got to go. I mean, how could her parents not let her go? Because, you know, one of her dads is, like, super into figure skating. And to be able to go to the the Olympics. Mm -hmm. Duh. All right. So let's talk about our plans. 
We have plans. So you may have noticed that we put out four episodes last year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or maybe it was five. Maybe it was five. So life is busy. <laughs> life is a little busy. And the thing is, it's not that it's it's not completely unmanageable. Um, but I I have many things going on right now. And Jacob has many things going on right now. And it's hard to make a space for this. Right. In a way that also includes reading a book that I don't have time to read because I have two grad classes I'm taking this semester, plus I'm working on getting a divorce, plus I'm living in a new state, plus I have a new job, plus I'm parenting. You're looking for a new house. I'm looking for a new house. So we're going to try something a little different for a bit, and uh, which is to talk about TV episodes. Yes. For a bit, because those are easier. They don't require any pre-planning. Yes, you can watch it. I can watch it and then talk about it. So uh, that's why there's 7 million podcasts like that, and we are joining their number, but we're going to do... But uh, we're going to... It's only going to be for a short time. Right. It's temporary, so if you don't like this turn, check back in a few months. And listen to my old episodes. <laughs> that's also true. <laughs> listen to the old one. I did that recently because I ran out of other podcasts. And I was like, I'll just listen to our podcast from the start because I'm a <laughs> raging ego egomaniac. I listen to mine sometimes, too, and I feel the same way. I'm like, am I supposed to laugh at my own jokes? Probably not, I but feel, I do it. I feel like it's a good reason to have a podcast. <laughs> yeah, so we'll do some TV shows in the near future. Uh, and I'm not sure that we've 100% decided on one particular. We've yeah, talked about yeah, Sabrina. Yeah, we talked about Sabrina. We talked about Riverdale Season 2. Um, I'm also up for suggestions if anyone has anything that they want we, us to talk about. So we'll be doing that. And uh, we hope you enjoy it because this is fun. We want to keep doing it. Yep. And we love you like crazy. We do love you like crazy. Give me a call when you get back. Hey there. Hey. They go to Barcelona, fuck, get caught, Josh gets expelled. <laughs> yeah. That's my that's my summary <laughs> that's of like the story. <laughs> the middle third of the book. <laughs>